might interest you to know that she was booted out of church because she prayed health over people. How about that? It's astounding. Just astounding. But it goes to show how the church has become so institutionalized. And it's all denominations and, and then... Uh, they have to be messianic and all that sort of stuff, you know? Uh, what are they going to understand? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not about denomination. And it's not about Jewishness. It's about Jesus. Well, Pastor Jim, that was a pretty good message. I'd call that a sermon. A mini-sermon, but... It was a good message. And what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? That's what, that's what Shakespeare says anyway. But the, the truth is that there is importance in a name. A name can be nothing more than a label. But in the New Testament and the Old Testament, Names are not just labels. They carry messages. As uh, Jim was saying, it's a matter of looking down underneath what's said. If you just ramble around on the surface, that's, that's fine for most people. But if you really want to get to know who this Jesus is, who this God is, you're going to have to understand that he is a master of communication. And he puts so much more into every word that we can imagine. And if you're willing to dig, it's astounding what you're going to find out. Amen? And everything that you find out actually augments your, your faith that he is exactly who he says he is. Amen? Well, today I want to talk about who you serve. Who do you serve? Bob Dylan wrote a lot of songs. And one of the songs he wrote that applies to what I'm going to talk about is You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long stri string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it might be the devil. It may be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words in that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 to 20. God says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord, your God, that you may obey his voice that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Did you ever stop to think that choice carries with it a loss? Choice carries with it a loss. You know, we so often think about what we gain without any thought about what we lose. Uh, when you choose this, you lose that. If you come to a fork in the road, if you take the right, you've lost the left. But unsaved man 
believes that he is autonomous, that he is a law unto himself. There's no denying it. Man has fashioned his own God in his own image. His own God in his own image. Now, I say that, but I know, as he does not know, that his image that he is manufacturing a God in is the image of Satan. Because there are only two gods, real gods. There's the one who created everything and there's Satan, the one who works against him. All the others are manufactured. They're all manufactured. Whereas man was created in the image of God, man has created his God in the image of Satan. And this is not a God to be followed into all righteousness, but it's a God designed to serve man in his perpetual quest for self-fulfillment and esteem, that is value. Now, he thinks that serving Satan is to his benefit, but that's far from the truth, far from the truth. And he thinks that in serving himself, he is escaping satanic clutches, and he's not. And this is not a God to be followed into righteousness. Uh-uh. This man-made God is what Nicholas Van Hoffman calls the great mush God, the mushy one. You know what mush is, right? <laughs> the great mushy one. Listen to his description of this icon of humanism. Because that's, you know, I'm telling you, it's in the church too. This mushy God is in the church. Right? The mush God has been known to appear to millionaires on golf courses. There you go, Kevin. <laughs> he appears to politicians at ribbon-cutting ceremonies and to clergymen speaking the invocation on national TV at either Democratic or Republican conventions. The mush god's presence is felt during Brotherhood Week and when Rotarians or Elks or other such fraternities come together. He is a lifeless deity, eager to serve all without regard to what is real or true. He is the great mushy one. The mush god has no theology to speak of, being a cream of wheat divinity, the mush god has no particular creed, no tenets of faith, nothing that would make it difficult for believer or non-believer alike to lower his head when the reverend, rabbi, father, mufti, or so-and-so will lead us in an innocuous, harmless prayer. For this god of public occasions is not a jealous god. He can even in, you can even invoke him to start a hookers convention, or and he see or it won't be offended. God of the Rotary, God of the Optimist Club, protector of the buddy system, the mush god is the lord of secular ritual, of the necess necessary but hypocritical forms and formalities that hush the divisive and the derisive. The mush god is a serviceable god whose laws are not chiseled on tablets, but written on sand, open to amendment, qualification, and erasure. This is a god that will, com com will compromise with you, make allowances, and declare all wars holy and any type of peace hallowed. Mush god's all over the place. You know, that's the complete opposite of the legalist God. See, he's too permissive, right? And the, this idea is, oh, well, he's a, a freedom-loving God. But, you know, without boundaries, you have chaos, not freedom. 
This is what you get when you choose human opinion over divine truth. Here is the permissive plastic God that tries to eclipse the one who was and is and is to come. Yahweh. Yahweh. Now you notice they didn't say Yahweh. I said Yahweh with a V. Everybody doesn't know that. That is, that is so prevalent. Yahweh is the self-existent creator of all that there is. Yahweh comes from four Hebrew letters or pictograms. Yad, He, Vav, He. And they have a specific meaning. When you put them all together, the hand, the window, the nail, and the window in the pictograms. But with what each one of those mean, it's really talking about God, the creator of everything. Because his work is to think, see, and it happens. Amen? When you look through a window, he imagines what he sees, he sees it, and he puts it together, and it becomes. That's what the word Yahweh actually means. He is the creator. And what has the mush god got to show for himself? Where are the signs of his great exploits on the earth? Where has he recorded great words of wisdom that assure stability and hope in times of great stress and disaster? This formless, impotent God has no bones. He is an empty balloon, a cloud without water, appearing to have substance but collapsing under his own weight. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And then in Romans 1.22-23, it says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And then in Romans 1.25 who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the mush God can be compared to the apostate and false teachers of Jude 1 verses 12 to 13. In fact, the mush God is one of the deities of the apostate church. It says... These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now let's listen again to how God, the God of the Bible, describes himself to us. He tells us that he is the unique creator of heaven in Genesis 1 verses 1 to 3. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out form and void and, grind, and and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is reiterated in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness doesn't want to comprehend it. He identifies himself as the one who is without beginning, and the one who gave beginning to everything that there is. He is what theology calls the uncaused 
cause, the uncaused cause. No matter what theory we accept for the origin of everything, we still collide with the God of the Bible, or we get caught up in infinite regress, infinite regression. If we spin off into speculation about extraterrestrial intelligences seeding the earth or manipulating our history, we still run into infinite regress. No matter what or who may have created us, somebody had to have created them, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's amazing to me how this seems to escape people who claim themselves to be intellectually above all. No matter what or who. And you know, God, he did it well. He just said it, the first words in the Bible, Barashit, Elohim bara. In the beginning, God created. <laughs> Where are you going to go from there? There's no way you can go from there. <laughs> For many years, I was fascinated by the various theories of ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence visitations, and their supposed appearances in the Bible. I remember when Eric von Janneken brought out his uh, movie, Chariots of the Gods. Boy, I was, I was so hooked. I was so hooked. It seemed to make so much sense. But you know, that's the problem, is when you don't have a full deck, you can't really play the game properly. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, looking back, I can say, yeah, I was pretty convinced by all the stonework and everything that we see that, uh, that uh, we go back before the flood and all that. Uh, well, you know, there, there must have been extraterrestrial intelligence come with their engineering feats of wonder and all that. But... You know, but then I read the Bible and find out that we had some pretty smart people called Adam and Eve and, uh, and the people that they had, they were really smart and they were very, very healthy and they lived to nine centuries. You know, think of how much you can accomplish if you don't just start to get Alzheimer's or something <laughs> after five or six generations, uh, decades, you know. So... Uh, then, then I started to realize, wait a minute, you know, chariots of the gods, and then you've got uh, ancient astronauts, you know, on television. Great show, I like it. I really like it. It's very, very well done. But they're coming to the wrong conclusions. It's not extraterrestrial. It's, it's God. What he did was he created beings that fell. And as they were falling, uh, it took a while before they had to be removed, but during that time, they were able to uh, to uh, of great in feats in, of engineering. Uh, I am I am utterly convinced that uh, we are probably not even as advanced today as they were before the flood. Yeah. But anyway, that's all theory. The point is, though, that. Uh, God is the creator and that we were not seeded here by aliens from other worlds. The integrity of the Bible is nothing short of astounding. Rest assured, there is no ETI connection with God. God is exactly who he says he is. He calls himself El Shaddai. El Shaddai means almighty in strength. That he can do whatever he wills without effort. That he does the greatest thing as easily as he does the least. This makes him different from all other beings. And he cannot operate outside of his nature. That's why... He's a trustworthy, reliable God. We can trust him. He reveals himself, and he doesn't lie. In Genesis 17, verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, 
I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. See, already we begin to see that God is the leader, not the follower. God is a leader, not a follower. In Genesis 14, verse 18, he calls himself El Elyon, which means God Most High. God Most High. And in, in that passage, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, El Elyon. There is none above him. He is supreme. He is unchangeable. He is perfect. Perfection is an absolute. He alone is perfect in all of the universe, in all of creation, and outside. God alone is perfect. There is no perfection outside of God. And that's why he's unchangeable. If he's perfect, why would he change? He can't change. In Genesis 16, verse 13, he is El Roy, which means the God who sees me. See, he's omnipresent everywhere at once and omniscient, which means he knows everything. We have people in our culture who think they know everything. Yeah. They call children. They call children. <laughs> Actually, yeah, well, you know, they are children, no matter what, uh, what bodies they're in. But, you know, they're scientists, politicians, um, philosophers, as they say, philosophers, right? Dan 2.22 says that even what has been done in darkness will be exposed to his light. See, he knows everything. There ain't nothing you're going to hide from God. In Exodus 15 verse 2, he records his name as Yah, Y-A-H, the self-existent one. He is strength and salvation. Strength and salvation. You see that in Genesis 15, 2. He reveals himself as Adonai. God, our Lord and Master. Again, it's quite often you'll see where it says Lord in our translations. If you check it out, it'll actually mean Yahweh. Or Y-H-V-H. Okay, again, Creator God. And he is Adonai. Adonai is another word that the Hebrews use for yad he vav he. Adonai, uh, which means master. Uh, it, the, and yes, I, th that's what I think. I think he is the adorable one, and I think that's where we get the word adore from, is Adonai. This title carries with it the sense of rulership, and the taking on of responsibility for the ones in his charge. In Genesis 22, verse 14, Abraham learned that he is Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, or as some say, Jehovah Jireh, is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He never asks us to do anything that he doesn't equip us to do. That is so darn important. You know, he never asks anybody to do anything that he does not equip us to do. Oh, but he can't do that. Well, sorry, he gives you everything you need in order to do it. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 3, declares him to be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals and restores. An ancient Hebrew document that I ran into a long time ago knew, says that his people knew him as Elilah Shaddai El Elyon Adonai, the one and only living God. He 
He is the one that Jesus taught us to call Father. Throughout Genesis, God identifies himself as the plural one. The plural one. How do you have a plural one? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Well, not in the Hebrew, because in the Hebrew, the word for one only is yachid. And the word for a plural one is echad. Echad. And in Jesus, we see yachid. And in God the Father, we see echad, because he's all three. And what's that mean? You know what I say. Same person, put on a different hat. When he's working as this, or working as that, or working as that. And we have that same thing in our government too. What are the three levels of government, Kevin? Executive, legislative, and judicial. Three forms of government working as one. Amen? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. That's so sad, isn't it? Well, that's, that's where the theory breaks down, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, let's move on. <laughs> Both, both the Yaqid and the Echad are, are defined in the Trinity, in the concept of the Trinity. It wasn't until the prophet Isaiah that we would begin to understand the concept of a triune God, the Holy Trinity. We see it in Isaiah 9 verse 6 that tells us, for, all, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Uh, Trinity, right there. Right there, Trinity. Also, in 1 Timothy 3.16, which declares, and without controversy, without argument, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. I'll tell you what, when you have a Jehovah's Witness come to your door, denying the Trinity, you told them those two verses, Isaiah 9, 6, and 1 Timothy 3, 16, and say, explain that. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's not really in the Bible. Uh, maybe it's in, a, not in our Bible, but it's in, <laughs> well, you know, their uh, New World Bible does have a lot of, a lot of things in it that should not be in there. For one of, one of the things is, it declares that Jesus to be a God, not God. That's in the first verse of uh, John. In the beginning was the word and the word was a God, is what it says in their version. Um, the Almighty One would show his strength and integrity in an act of supreme loving kindness as he took on the limitation of the flesh and revealed himself to us as the man Jesus. In Jesus of Nazareth, God revealed himself as love incarnate. The God who cares enough to subject himself to the horrors of physical pain and suffering so that man can live forever in the place, a place of never-ending delight. Now I'm going to give you, quickly, how we see Jesus in God's word as God. Uh, it's going to be hard to do this. Okay. In Isaiah, he's called... I'm not going to give you the references. In Isaiah, he's called the mighty God. In Luke, he's God, of, God my Savior. In Matthew, he's Emmanuel, who is God with us. In Romans, he's the Lord. In Titus, he's our blessed hope. In Jeremiah, he's our righteousness. In Revelation, he's Alpha and Omega. 
and he's also Alpha and Omega in the first verse of the Bible. In Hebrews, he's the author and finisher of our faith. In John, he's the living word. In Colossians, he's the image of the invisible God. In Colossians, in 1 Corinthians, he's the wisdom of God. In Hebrews, he's the brightness of his glory. In John, he's the way, the, the truth, and the life. In Matthew, he's the lamb. In Revelation, he's a tree of life. In John, again, he's the bread of life. In John, again, he is the light of the world. Uh, in Revelation, he's the bright and morning star. In Isaiah, he is the redeemer. In Revelation, he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And in Hebrews, he is the prince of peace. And in Psalm, he is the king of glory. In Romans 4.17, he is Yahweh, the God who calls things as though they are or as though they are not, either one. The Apostle Paul tells us in Acts 17, verses 24 to 25, that God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God wants us to reach out for him and to find him. And he gives us everything we need in order to accomplish that. In Acts 17, 28, it says that he wants us to know that he is not far from each one of us. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Why? Because we are his offspring. He created us for him, for himself. That is our true destiny, is to be with him 